for this. Appreciate that. Well, holidays being passed. Let's turn back to Mark chapter 4. I want to finish this chapter today. This is a passage that, uh, honestly, I had preached before. It hasn't been that long ago because uh, I was preaching those sermons on church, biblical church membership, and this is one of the passages we dealt with. But now you have a much greater understanding of the context of what's about to happen today, what's going to unfold. When we see these different things happen, it helps us to read quite a bit before and quite a bit after, so we know exactly what was surrounding the events. And so, really, let's go back to verse 20, because that's where we need to get to that, because verse 20 goes along with these other verses. And so, verse 20, we are told that uh, the multitude had come together, again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. Remember, Jesus was so popular at this point that crowds, you know, gathered where he went, made it impossible to get close to him. And in verse 21, when his friends heard it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. Now, there's a little parenthesis there. So he's accused after that of, of uh, working in the power of Satan. And Jesus, of course, said that all things will be forgiven you, except grieving the Holy Spirit that way, or blaspheming him. But then Mark picks back up in verse 31. So I think really verse 31 chronologically occurs right after verse 21. His friends and family had come to lay hold on him. And verse 31 says, There came then his brethren and his mother. Now that's a more specific designation of who it was who had come to get him. Standing without, they said unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without on the outside seek for you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him, and he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now, of course, Jesus' popularity informs what we just read. His family could not get to him. There were so many people surrounding the house where he was. But let's remind ourselves why they were there. They were there to get him. They were there to stop him. They were there to lay hold on him. They were there to put him in a straitjacket. They were there to take him off somewhere till he calmed down and stopped believing that he was this prophet sent from God. Such was their attitude. Such was what they knew about him. But of course, when we read that, when we understand that, we come to realize that they were sorely mistaken. But all of us understand the meaning of family, don't we? At least we do in part. We've got this say, as a time of sermon shows there, we've got this say, saying that we've always said how that blood is thicker than water. And in our current usage of that phrase, we tend to think of it as meaning that the blood of family, biological relationship, is more important and meaningful than other relationships. We've all seen family members who will fight each other like cats and dogs. But when you go and threaten one of them, the whole clan all of a sudden comes together and they're going to take you out, even though they were just trying to take each other out the moment before you offended somebody. Uh, teachers, you can all give us a little testimony, administrators, you can show us and give us examples of how parents, even though their child just did something wrong, and there's no doubt about it. Parents tend to be extremely defensive about our children and not see maybe the truth is right before us when they are disciplined. Well, it happens all the time. I've heard uh, mothers defend the actions of their own children and sin against God with this justification, I just want them to be happy. Well, family causes us to lose focus sometimes. Family can cause us to lose our sense of judgment and discernment. And probably the worst place we see family relationships displayed in negative light is in church. 
occasionally in this part of the world, and I know none of y'all know anything about that, uh, sometimes family relationships in church can rear up and create controversy and create conflict. Uh, and so family churches are hard to pastor. They can be. They're hard sometimes to stick together. Again, um, either two families are fighting each other or people within a family are fighting. It doesn't matter. The family relationship makes it worse. Or if I would tell you that God absolutely agrees with the statement, blood is thicker than water. But maybe not the way you think of it. I'm not going to argue today that family is not important. The contrary, I think what Mark is showing us is the priority that Jesus does put on family, but it's not the priority that we naturally normally think of. The priority he's going to put on family is spiritual. It's not biological. It's heavenly. It's, it's Christian body, that following. That, those are his family, he says, not those who are outside the door trying to apprehend him or to take him in to custody. So I want us to get our focus today as we look at this into the spiritual realm, in the spiritual area. And I understand that when the Bible talks about, as you were in Sunday school this morning, it talks about households, talks about families, Jesus specifically here talking about a family. There are some important truths that all of us have to understand who are indeed a part of the family of God. Now the first thing I want to point out is the oblivion of his earthly family. How much they did not understand. Now, we just we just came from Christmas and uh, Mark Lauer has written that famous song, Mary Did You Know? Well, yes she did, for the most part. I think she did understand that Christ was the Messiah. I think she did understand that he was sent from God. She's the only one who truly knew and had experienced becoming pregnant without uh, a man, without being married, without a husband. Uh, there was no biological contribution in any way whatsoever uh, toward the birth of her oldest son. Jesus was indeed a supernatural miracle. She understood that. Which, in a way, causes me to have to ask the question, Mary, here's another song from Mark to write. We should, I'll email him and say, write this one. Maybe y'all should write it. Mary, why are you trying to stop him? Why are you outside the door trying to lay hold of him? To apprehend him, as verse 21 says, why are you there trying to stop him from fulfilling the purpose that God has revealed in his life? Well, the reason being is she was oblivious to him. For whatever reason, I know not. It's interesting to me to look at his brothers and his sisters. By the way, Mary was a perpetual virgin. She and Joseph had kids the normal way. And so I don't want to offend our Catholic friends, but they're just dead wrong. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. She bore children biologically. And those children grew up undoubtedly resenting the oldest child. I mean, I, you've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. How would you like to grow up with a perfect brother? You might have a brother that thinks he was perfect. You know he wasn't. But how would you like to grow up with one you absolutely was? Never back talk, never sass, never disobey. And when your mom looks at you and says, why can't you be more like him? There's nothing you say. Huh? Because we all want to be more like him. And so there was some resentment. And we know several other names. And, and specifically, we know James and Jude. That they later were converted. But at this point, none of them were believing in and so they were oblivious to certain things. They were oblivious undoubtedly to his relationship with his heavenly father. Indeed, Mary should have known, but for whatever reason, either she knew and told them that they didn't believe her, or she herself began to doubt. I don't know the answer to that. But for whatever reason, she's standing outside the door to apprehend him along with his other, or with his brothers and sisters, her other children. They didn't understand the relationship 
that he had with his heavenly father, that he was indeed God, that he was the one sent from heaven. The gospel has called every believer in this sense to place the relationship with God above every human relationship. And that doesn't prevent the pain, however, when one's family does not share that same belief. Many of you are here this morning and you're here without your family. You love your family. You love those who are related to you, but they do not share the same faith in Christ that you share. And that hurts. I know that. But I, I, I encourage you today because the real family that you are to be thankful for and that you are to be involved in is here. Your spiritual family. Now they were oblivious to something else. They were oblivious undoubtedly for the purpose of his ministry. He had already healed and done some amazing supernatural things about this point. But for whatever reason, they still felt it necessary to stop him. They thought he was mistaken in spite of all the supernatural things that he had already done. And finally, they were oblivious to the nature of his relationship to his followers. Not sure how they saw them. Maybe they were intimidated by them. Maybe they were worried that somebody would hurt him, that somebody was using him. We don't know. But for whatever reason, they had not grasped yet that they, even though they were biologically related to him through Mary, were the ones, and notice the word in the text, it's outside. It's outside. That's a bad place to be when it comes to the family of God. Isn't it? You don't want to be standing on the outside. They were. And those on the inside, Jesus says, were his real family. Let me just stop there and say, you do understand. That we live in a world, especially here in the American South. There are a lot of people connected in different ways to churches. They think that because they attend occasionally, they're a part of the body of Christ. They think that because their family has a history, they are related to the body of Christ. They think that even because they're a church member, that guarantees they are a part of the body of Christ. We've watered down the weak in the gospel for so many years. Cultural Christianity is one of the worst plagues to ever fall upon the people of God. Try witnessing to people who think they're fine because of some made up, imagined relationship they have with God. Happens all the time. People claim one thing, but God knows nothing. Now, in response to their oblivion, Jesus issues this statement. Instead of saying, well, tell them I'll be outside in just a minute. If my family were to come in the middle of the church and somebody's passing me a note and, and say, your family needs to talk to you after service, I would read the note, put it aside, finish the service, then go outside later and meet them. That's not what Jesus says. His response to them is interesting to me because when they tell him they're out there, he asks he answers with a question. Don't you hate it when people do that? Don't you? <laughs> right. Uh, he, he answered with a question. He said, who is my family? That must have started. And somebody might have said, you don't know? <laughs> I can tell you. They said, you, they said you're, they're your family. I don't, who knows what their response was when he says it? But the, he responds to the question, who is my family? And then he says this. Points around him. There were people at the table. There were people who were probably tax collectors. We've talked about them. Nobody liked those guys. There were harlots. Everybody knew they were sinners. There were sinners of every sort imaginable, perhaps, who were surrounding him at the table in this house with him, reclining and eating where he was. And Jesus, as he asked the question, points to everybody else who's there. Because these people, no matter what their past was, they had decided to follow him. They had decided to believe on him. And so he motions with his hands to them and he says, he looks around about on them, verse 34, and says, Behold, look, these are my mother and my brother, me, my siblings. 
These are my family. For whosoever shall do the will of God, here it is. Whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Hmm. I think his words indicate a couple of things. Let me share these with you. I think, first of all, his words indicate a relationship that's absolutely irreplaceable. A new kind of relationship. A new kind of family. A new kind of relating to people. And so, look at the rest of the New Testament. We get glimpses of this. This is not the first or last time, it may be the first, but it's not the last time that Jesus is going to say something like this. Over in John's Gospel, chapter 3, John starts later and says uh, in his ministry, perhaps the Mark does, the timeline's not perfectly aligned, it doesn't matter, it's not what the Holy Spirit intended to do. But John records this in John 3, verses 5 through 7. Jesus is answering uh, Nicodemus, remember? He says, or answering those who were inquiring, I shouldn't say, in that chapter where Nicodemus appears. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I, I say unto you, Here's how we become a member of the family of God. Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, what's water? You ladies know what it is. Right? I never forget that I would not be proved for anything in the world. But, man, the most frightening moment of my life is when you guys gave us a shower, a baby shower. We went home. And Lori shut my fingers in the car door. And I'm on my knees screaming, help me, help me, help me. We, no, no, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty bad. We go inside, she sits down, tired as all get out. I don't remember if we'd actually gone to bed or not. Maybe we were going to bed. And she looks at me and she says, my water just Do you let us know what that means? That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. The meaning of that phrase, being born of water, is natural birth. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you got you are born of water and of the Spirit. Unless a man is born both ways, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, unless you come from the family of man into the family of God by a spiritual birth, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. I preached not long ago, man, I liked his reasoning. He was correct. You got a whole world out here that uses as a justification every deviant lifestyle imaginable by saying, I was born this way. Now before you argue, I'm going to rethink this a little bit. Before you argue with that statement in every sense of it, think about this. The reason those people pursue those lifestyles is because they are born in sin. Can a person be born effeminate and have a natural inclination for homosexuality? Yes. You say, but doesn't that go against what God's first says? No. Because Jesus said, you must be born again. And being born again changes that. It implies a regeneration of who you are. A person may have may be born with an inclination to be unfaithful to his wife in the same manner. But that's no excuse. Either, because the Bible says a man must be born again. So to enter God's family, we must be born again. But there's another way. There's another way that anybody can become a member of a family, and that is through the idea of adoption. And the scripture says this, Paul says this in Galatians chapter 4, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son to your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The impact of that verse is this. And I, 
I feel it and I sense it. I was thinking about this this morning. Adoption is just as legal as is a natural birth. It is so legal, I was thinking about this, that two little girls that I had nothing to do with them coming into this world. At this point in time, if my son were not to have any kids, God forbid that be the case, but if he and Maggie were not to have children, those two girls that had, I had nothing to do with, totally outside my life's family, would inherit everything eventually that I had. That's how, that's how serious it is. In the same way, Paul says, we've been adopted in the family of God, so much so, and the Romans understood this, that we have the same rights as a natural born child. We are heirs. So, in a way, I thought that this way, the Bible makes sure that all the bases are covered. If you want to be in the family of God, you have to be born again. And you also have to be adopted. So you, you got it both ways, right? We are born again into his family. We are adopted into his family as well. Not only that, but not only does he, his words indicate an irreplaceable relationship, there's an undeniable responsibility. Who is my family except those, as he says here, who do the will of God? Jesus said his true family is indicated and compromised by those who obey the commands of God. And John later is going to indicate that obedience is a necessary sign of being a true believer. There's another thing that cultural Christianity has slapped us upside the head with and got us all discombobulated. Let me tell you something. You've got to get this straight. If you claim to be a Christian, your life will at least generally look like it. Amen? Don't sit there on your hands. I'm telling you the truth. We've come to the place we believe somebody can come to a church, join a church, claim to be a Christian, live like the devil, and make the claim, hey, I'm great. I'm right with God. I'm going to heaven. I got this for you. No, they're not. How do I know that? Look at what Jesus said in First John, or John, rather. Echo the words of Jesus. Here's what he said in 1 John 2. Hereby we do know that we know him. Here's how we know. You see, some of you think that you know that you know that you know because of this strange feeling down deep inside. We write songs about this. And we glorify this. I know God is real because I feel him in my soul. I Listen, I got friends who sing that. And it's a wonderful song, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Your feelings will lie to you. Sometimes the way you feel is a spiritual nudge from God. Sometimes it's that pizza you should not have eaten. You know, I, if, I, if I were a better individual, you're a better salesman, I could convince you of anything. I could make you feel any way I wanted to. Somebody's good at that can do it. But that's not what John said. He said, here's how we know that we know him. Pretty simple. If we keep his commandments. Now, he's not saying if you perfectly keep them because we'd all be in trouble. But I'll tell you this. We're talking about, I was not talking about this the other day. I know this, that as imperfect as I am, I still can't get away with anything. Anybody here with me? I can't show the truth. If I show the truth in my comments, trying not to tell somebody something I don't want them to know, I get to live with somebody. What am I just going to do? Right there. I, if, if, if I am dishonest in some other way, just even the slightest little bit, my, my conscience is pricked by the Holy Spirit, right? I know that I know Him because it is my desire to keep His commandments. Now, the man or woman who is out here claiming to have a relationship with the church and does whatever they want, and, and they have no concern for what God has said in His Word, that they deny what God's Word has said as to how we live, these words go trouble for them. He that says, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a child's birth, not mine. He's a liar. 
People lie to themselves all the time, don't they? I'm a religious person. I know how. I'm a member of the church. I'm, I'm fine. I'm going to heaven. <coughs> John said, don't look inside your heart. Look at your life. And you're not right. right. But if there is this upward trend through the years of God bringing you from one point of growth to the other, overcoming this sin, then begin to conquer this one, Never being perfect, never accomplishing all of that. Often failing, but man, you get back out there every time and you keep following the desire to live for him. John says, that's how you know. It's really that simple. Now, on top of that, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So he's, again, separating this idea of biological family from spiritual family. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, brethren, and sisters, and that's a strong word. If he does not hate them, now he's not telling you to, you know, go kick your mama off the porch. He's saying to you that my love, if your love for me, does not make your love for them look like hate and comparison, then you cannot be my son. Strong words. You don't get that preach much because we don't want to put too many you know, expectations. We don't want to put a burden on people. I'm here to tell you, God convicted me a long time ago to preach the truth from this book. And if I ever want to find the price, they're going to come to Christ knowing the whole story. I'm not going to lie to them. It will be the best thing they ever do, but it will also be the hardest thing they ever do because they had some potential and possibility of costing them everything. Everything. We don't understand what it costs. Our country knows persecution. I'm thankful for that. But it's also cost us not understanding the level of commitment that is required to follow Jesus. If we're not willing to give up everything to follow him, are we really following? Now, how weighty are Jesus' words on this occasion? Someone has written this. I want to read this for you. Mark Strauss in the New American Commentary. I'm sorry, it's on the XL Commentary. Writes this. He says, The family relationship proposed by Jesus, and listen very carefully, Replaces any ethnic, tribal, national association. Let me let that sit there for a minute before I go on. Church membership must reflect this new family relationship. It must preclude a racial prejudice, a social preference, even American Patriotism must take a distant second to allegiance and loyalty to brothers and sisters in Christ wherever they are. He's right. If you understand what it means to be a citizen of heaven, and if you understand what it means to be a family of God, then what he just said will bring true to you. Now, William Martin has added. Some things I'll give you before I finish. He's, he's given four commonalities of true kinship. We sing that song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I grew up with that song. I love that song. And I think the words are true because they reflect what Barclay says here. He says there are four commonalities of true kinship. They are true of biological kinship. They are true of spiritual kinship. It says, first of all, they, they share a common experience. What is that experience for us as Christians? Well, the experience for all of us that we share is that we were brought from death into life. We were brought from darkness into light. You can't look around in this room and see anybody else who's a greater sinner than you. Because we're all born sinners, separated from God, subject to His wrath, 
under his wrath. And if you think about it, that ought to humble us so that that forms the common experience upon which we build our relationships. I can love you even when you fail. You can love me even when I fail because I know for a fact that I am a sinner. I got a stinking suspicion of you are. Right? We know we all are. The common experience that we all share is being forgiven of our sin. And I'm a humblest to the point of being able to love each other. Secondly, Marcus says that, that kinship is born out in, in a common interest. Family members share in family interests. They want to, to promote what's best for the family, right? They, they, they want to do what's best for each other. They cannot maintain this aspect of family by living in isolation. A person can't stay by themselves and be a real part of a family. Neither can a person not be a part of a church and be a part of God's spiritual family. Works the same way, amen? Exactly the same. Proverbs number three says that God, true kinship lies in a common obedience. Well, that's true of what Jesus said. You look at what he said, what brought together that diverse group of followers, and even at first who were following Jesus, was their common allegiance to Christ as Lord. It's the same thing that allows an unruly, diverse group of men to become a slick, well-oiled military regiment. The one thing they all bow to the same authority. Again, people balk at this. Cultural Christianity, we don't talk about that. People have crucified John McCarthy for years. I remember when I first heard the controversy over Lordship Salvation. People said, he's adding words. Yeah. He's saying that you have to do something to make Jesus Lord before you can be saved. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is exactly what the Bible says. What Jesus just said. If you want to prove you are a member of my family, you have to do what I say. You have to follow my commandments. You've got to follow the commandments of God. And so I'll, I'll, I'll double down on this. The person who has not made Jesus Lord is not a part of the family of God. How can they be? Isn't that what he's saying? Why, why would you obey somebody unless they are your master? Now you kids grew up maybe in a big home. I think Brother Phil and some of these others grew up in large families, Dorothy and son. The one thing all of you should do. The one thing that kept you together, whether you realize it or not, is your obedience. To your mother and father. You take that away, the whole thing flies all, all to pieces, doesn't it? The family unit is destroyed. Barclay continues one other thing. He says that true kinship lies in a common goal. Again, the, 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 there's nothing for binding men and women together like a common aim. What is our aim in the Christian name? It's no one Christ more. And discipling others to follow him. It's really that simple. My job is to teach you everything I possibly can learn about God. Your job and mine is to follow what we have learned and take that to others, discipling them to also follow Christ. That's simple. Now, those things that we have in common are just a few of the things that that unite us in that unique way. And whenever I think about this, and I, listen, I apologize for even using this personal illustration. Maybe I'll get sick of me to do it. But I, I cannot help what I have learned from our experience with our girls. I look back at this list, and, and it's just amazing to me how true that is 
And if it's true biologically and on a human level, it's got to be the Lord's true spirit. Common experience, sharing the past. One thing you'll learn about Brooklyn and Kaylee is that they will, you know, block each other's eyes. Uh, whenever they get a chance. But if you dare go after one of them, the other is immediately all done for you. I mean, it's bad. When we first got uh, Brooklyn and Katie, Katie, Katie could not talk. We didn't know what the world she was saying. She had her own language from Mars. I mean, that's what we thought. But the amazing thing was, is that whichever she would speak, Brooklyn would hear it and say, yeah, she said this. And I'm like, how did you get that? She understood every bit of it. And as I thought about that over the years now, I, it's pretty evident that what binds them together, even more than their biological relationship, and they are related biologically to them. What binds them together more than anything is their common experience. If you get them by themselves sometimes, and I don't bring this up, but sometimes they'll start talking about seeing their parents taken out of their house by the police. Brooklyn talks about having salt and pepper to eat. She talks about that. That's what she paid me for. That's all they She talks about other things. And as I looked at her relationship with her sister, I thought, you know, that was forged in the fire of hardship and want. I don't think that would ever be broken. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have got to come to terms and understand that we share, in more ways than we like to think, a common of being alienated from God, of being strangers from Him, of being on the outside looking in, and nobody, nobody caring for ourselves. <coughs> you look around you, there's not anybody here, including myself, who hold up my accolades, hold up my qualifications. I don't have any. I'm in the same boat you are. And that common experience ought to bind us together. Those two girls have, have had common interests now. Being part of the family is just an awesome thing for them. Their interests are common because they want to, they want to further the Bowman family agenda. All right? That's what they do. Do they all? Common obedience. They might struggle with that. It's like all of them. But they don't, they don't have to listen to their Oh, I have to listen to John here and me. Sometimes, Lord, sometimes. But they understand. And so when we give them an order, we give it to both at the same time. And they both have to listen because they should have had come. And not that they have. They have a common goal, a goal of, of being a part of that family for the years to come, advancing our agenda as well as any they might develop. It's really amazing. Adoption is a wonderful thing. And it speaks to us of God in so many different ways, but never, never, never more than when one of them crosses the line. Brooklyn's on most of that teenage demonic period. <laughs> Not far away, you already see the precursor of my Maybe she won't go there. I remember the first time that we were we went somewhere in that and I pulled her up on my lap and she looked at me, she said, Papa Jay, not in public. I said, okay. Here we go. Here we go. But the other night we had them. You, you guys know what it is, grandparents. Well, you don't ask them, but you just look their breath and they say, I'm going to sit on your bed. I'm going to snuggle with you. They crawl up there, man. There's nothing like that. 
And you realize this relationship, although it's not of blood, is heavy. It's as heavy as anything biological, and it's as meaningful as anything biological. But the kicker of all, I've told this before, I'm sorry for sharing it again. But well, there is no. They have been there long and here and standing outside the doors. Maybe some of you would be after she put them to bed and Katie was crying because she was just not settled in yet. And Brooklyn said this, the, the mama said this. She said, Katie, it's okay. We, here's what she said. We are safe here. These people love. When you walk in that door, I don't care what you do, I don't care what you pass me. I don't care how many failures you've had, how big of a mantra you've made in the name of Christ, it doesn't matter. If you have bowed your heart in your life to Jesus Christ as Lord, you are safe. These people love you. They love me. I love you. If they don't, we'll straighten them out. <laughs> That's what families do. Right? Now, I'm not trying to be sentimental. I'm trying to point you to spiritual truth. Jesus is the one that said, Who is my family? That's the question. I mentioned the phrase, blood is thicker than water. I think I've told you this before. <laughs> Whenever I heard that, I used to think, that doesn't make sense. Blood is different. I mean, what kind of blood is talking about? Well, go back to what Jesus said. The lesson of man is born of water and out of the spirit. He cannot be a part of the kingdom of heaven. In the old days, that phrase was used. When a soldier would go out to battle, he was expected to give his life for his comrades. No question. If you're part of that army, they didn't ask you if you were willing to give your life. They was expected you were willing to give life because the rationalization was this. And here's where the phrase comes from. We have done it down and we have destroyed the meaning. But here's the origin. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. The blood of the covenant is thicker and the water of the womb. We have a covenant with God and with each other. Sealed and signed in the blood of our Savior. That is heavier, that is thicker, that is more meaningful than any other earthly relationship. Ever the, blood of, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And that's what it means. Let's stand here. Head to our God's place. Lord, thank you that Jesus reminds us who our true family is. God, we love the church we are in. We love each other. And Father, I pray that if ever the faults and failures of others overshadow the love we have for each other, help us to come back to this point that we've talked about today. Lord, also that responsibility that Jesus meted out is so heavy for all of us. God, how can we claim to be your child if we are not willing to obey you and to be a part of of your family, specifically this church. Or there are other churches who comprise the family of God. We know that, but our experience is here. This is all we know in this moment. And so I pray that you would increase and, and cause to come about the faith and the commitment that somebody needs us for to follow Christ, to love Him, to make Him Lord of everything in their life, to finally surrender to Him and allow Him to forgive their sin, wash it away. And make them a part of God's family. Lord, let that happen to your honor and glory, not for us to boast about anyway, but Lord, for what you want to do. And again, thank you for the family that you've given us.
the family of God, the brothers and sisters in Christ who mean so much to us, strengthen our bonds and our ties as we contemplate these things by the way, remember why we are part of these people is because of what you've done in our life and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Look what it looks like to gather the place just a moment.